Hello, hello everyone. I'm here in my kitchen getting ready to share the Word of God with you. I hope you're having a good week. Um, I hope you're having a wonderful week. Today I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. Um, have you ever made a mistake based on your first impression of something or, or someone? Have you ever experienced the feeling that of something looking or seeming really good but then it turned out to be a big mistake and maybe even a nightmare. Well, today I'm going to talk about it looks good until it doesn't. And I think we've all had examples in our life that something looked really good or seemed really good, but then when we got into it, it wasn't good at all or it was a really big mistake. <clears throat> Let me give you a few really practical examples. Um, those of you who know me know that I like to garden. So, um, Honeysuckle. When I first became acquainted with honeysuckle, which is years ago, I thought it was just lovely because it smelled just, the fragrance, fragrance was just beautiful. It smelled so good. When I, a lot of times when I would get soap, I would want honeysuckle scented soap because it just smelled so good. And they had such pretty flowers, um, just lots and lots of pretty uh, white flowers in the springtime and I just thought they were wonderful. Did you know that at the end of the 19th century, bush honeysuckle, which came from Asia, was introduced into botanical gardens in North America? And from 1960 to around 1984, our government, the U.S. Department of Agri Agriculture, promoted bush honeysuckle. It was used for an ornamental plant and also for a wildlife habitat and erosion control. And so the government really wanted people to grow honeysuckle. And, um, but in the 1950s, it escaped the normal, like uh, I'm gonna plant it in my yard type of intentional cultivation and became an invasive species in the United States. In Missouri, bush honeysuckle has spread everywhere throughout the whole state. It chokes out native plants. It um, creates an understory in, in the forest along the, the woods that absolutely chokes out any native plants. Uh, plants can't get um, uh, sun, they can't get nutrients, they can't get uh, water because the honeysuckle just zaps everything out. Uh, new trees can't start growing because there's not enough sun, there's not enough water or nutrients because the bush honeysuckle takes it all. So um, the honeysuckle takes everything out and the native plants and the native trees can't survive. And where I live, I've spent countless hours trying to just start to try to eliminate all the honeysuckle that we have. It's a horrible, horrible thing. So honeysuckle looked really good until it didn't. <laughs> Another one is the Bradford pears. Bradford pears originated in China, and these trees were introduced in the United States by the Department of Agriculture as an ornamental landscape tree in the mid-1960s. They became very popular with landscapers because they were cheap, they survived well, and they were easy to transport. They were really, um, uh, hardy and they grew quickly. Uh, they were considered the perfect tree and subdivision developers and homeowners just gobbled them up. They're hardy and they can grow anywhere. But as it turns out, the Bradford pear trees are invasive. They crowd, crowd out and shade out other plants. If you look at uh, almost all the roadsides, at least here in the St. Louis area, at this time of the year, um, there's white flowering trees everywhere, and those are Bradford pears, most of them are. Uh, the roadsides are just blanketed with Bradford pears. They're not native, they've spread everywhere. They crowd out our native plants, and uh, they have a very weak branch structure. Their branches are brittle, the, the branches break off, the tr trunk split. And they're so bad that several states have actually banned selling and growing Bradford pears. Something that was really good, it, the Bradford pear tree looked really good until they didn't look really good. <laughs> Another thing that looked really good until it didn't look really good was Agent Orange. I don't know if 
uh, you all remember that. But Agent Orange was a mix of chemical herbicides first used in the 1940s. It, we, it was used in agriculture and sprayed along railroad tracks and along telephone lines, power lines to control vegetation. And it was also used extensively in Vietnam to defungal, de, uh, sorry, defoliate uh, the jungles uh, so they could see the enemies. And it was very effective. It was really good at what it did. It was really good until it wasn't really good. Agent Orange was responsible for an unbelievable amount or number of cancers and birth defects in the Vietnamese populations and with U.S. Serv servicemen. It, it turned out to be a very, very dangerous uh, concoction of herbicides. So Agent Orange uh, looked really good until it didn't. Another one, I mean, you could go on with these examples for, for about 10 days, I think, because we all have, have had things in our own lives that we thought were really good and they turned out not to be. Another one is George Santos. I don't know if you all are familiar with him. He's a New York representative who won his 2023 election bid with 54.2% of the vote. 54.2% of voters in his district thought he was good until he wasn't. <laughs> he lied about his ancestry, his grandparents, his mother, his employment, his previous employment, his high school and his college education uh, and the degrees he earned. He, he lied about his income. He lied about charities that he was involved in and on and on and, and on and looked on. looked good so, to a majority of his district's voters until he didn't. I had to stop for a minute because I said something wrong and I needed to stop and restart so I didn't make a mistake. So, or we could talk about all of the financial things that looked really, really good until they didn't. Um, people get sucked into these things because it does truly look good, looks so good. Like, you know, different Bitcoin and cryptocurrency schemes, Ponzi schemes, uh, some fundraisers, you know, I had mentioned George Santos before. He had fundraisers for, for uh, he had pet charities and, and the money didn't really go to the pet charities. They were just scams, but people thought, oh, this is really good. I can help out pets. Uh, different GoFundMe, uh, you know, uh, fundraisers that, you know, they're for a really good cause and people really want to help, but it turns out that the person posting it takes all the money and the person that needed the money doesn't get it. Or Jim Baker, if you recall, all of his schemes for vitamins and survival food, TBN and Heritage USA, just all kinds of things that looked really, really good to people, really important to people, but it turned out that it looked good until it wasn't. Of course, we can all identify with how good certain foods look at first until we learn about their sugar or their salt or their fat content. And so the food looked good until it didn't. Or how about all those diet plans? I mean, there's a zillion diet plans that promise all these things and it looks really good until it doesn't. You know, and you find out the cost or you find out that that particular plan has health risk to it. So things can look good, but until they didn't. I think we can all identify lots of things that looked good when they ended up not being good. Sometimes we can be deceived or sometimes we use bad judgment or sometimes it's a little bit of both. So let's see today how we can avoid this mistake of seeing things that look good, but they really aren't. Um, as human beings, we like to think that we're always right. I know I like to think I'm right and I think most people have that in them that they like to think they're right. They think that they are thinking the right thing, that the they don't make mistakes. Well, we all make mistakes, but you know, in your mind, you think you're doing the right thing. Um, and it can really be hard to listen to other people's point of view. It's really hard a lot of times to consider that we might be wrong. In Proverbs 12, 15, <coughs> it says, the way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. In other words, a wise man can understand that he might not be considering all the angles, 
that he might not be able to see all the good and bad points of, a, of an issue, that he might not uh, have all the facts that he needs to consider to make a decision. But a fool basically says, I know I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, you know, don't tell me anything. I don't need any more information. You know, I'm convinced I'm right, so, you know, you just shut everything out. A wise man gets opinions from people who might not agree with his thoughts. Let me, let me repeat that. A wise man gets opinions from people who might not agree with his thoughts and listens to them respectfully. That's the only way you're going to learn. That's the only way you're going to grow. That's the only way you can make wise decisions is listen to all sides of a matter. Listen to people who disagree with you to find out why. Um, let me ask you a question. When you're, when you're thinking about an issue and you're talking to people, can you really articulate um, what the other person is thinking and, and why he thinks the decision you're making is good or bad? Um, if you can't really understand a person's other point of view, you might not be able to see different sides of the mountain, so to speak. Be careful, so careful who you're listening to. You know, on one hand, it's good to get lots of counsel, lots of advice, lots of different opinions, but we can also listen to the wrong people. If you're uh, getting financial advice from people who can't handle their finances, that wouldn't be a wise decision. Um, so think, think real hard about the people that you're listening to. And please, please, please stay away from people who are always saying that they're hearing from God or God told, told me to tell you this or God told me that you're doing this or that right or wrong. Um, that saying, putting God in the mix when they're telling you something gives them too much sway over you. And a lot of times they're not hearing from God any more than, than another person that's just part of, part of the way they think or part of the way they talk. Um, it's really important to, to, to get with God yourself and see for yourself what God is saying to you. In Acts 15, 6, <clears throat> it's talking about the church at that time had a, had a, um, a theological issue to discuss or to decide on. And it says that they had a long discussion with the apostles and the elders before they made their decision. <clears throat> so it shows that, you know, when we're making a decision process, whether it be about um, friends that we have or a vacation we're taking or a job we're taking or employees that we're hiring or a, a car that we're buying, it's good to think it out, to talk it out, to have long discussions about it, to really think about it. When making decisions, we need to pray. We need to pray. We need to ask God for his wisdom, for his insight. And if you will do that, take time to pray and take time to listen to God, it will save you a lot of heartache. Ask God for wisdom and research, research, research. Whatever it is that you're doing, find out the facts about it. Educate yourself about the things you're dealing with, with the decisions you need to make. Even if it's, you know, on doctrinal issues, what you believe about God, what you believe about the Bible, don't just, don't just, you know, listen to somebody, somebody teach and just, just accept it. Do your own research, educate yourself, find out about those things yourself. Don't be in a rush to make decisions. Take your time, take your time. You should never be in a rush to make decisions unless it's a, you know, life or death matter and use your common sense. And if you don't have, be smart enough to know if you don't have common sense. Your history with things should be able to tell you whether you have common sense or not. And some people just don't. Some people do. Sometimes we have common sense about one thing, but not with another. Think about the consequences of your decision if you are wrong. And that opens up the fact that, you know, being able to admit that you could be wrong and what are the consequences if you're wrong. So these things are all really important to avoid that. It looked good until it didn't problem in your life. In James 1, 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. So if we need wisdom about a, a, a thing that we're deciding upon, 
Ask God and he will give you wisdom. He'll give it to you generously. The Bible promises you that. Another thing we need to do is we need to know the Bible. We need to know the word of God and we need to apply it to our life. And that will save us a whole heap load full of trouble. It'll save us so much trouble if we just do what the Bible says. The Bible has so many treasures of wisdom for making decisions in your life. Life. For example, you can look up the word fool. None of us want to be a fool, right? Well, the Bible says so much about what a fool is like and what the characteristics of a fool are like. So look up those things and make sure you're not doing any of those things. You can work up, look up, say, the word liar, and you can see how strongly God warns us about that sin and how strongly he warns us about staying away from liars. Because we've all come across liars in our life. We've come across liars in, in, you know, in, in our home and employment, in the workplace, in our neighbors, and, and in politics, and the media, and just there's liars, liars everywhere. And we need to know how the Bible says to deal with liars and how we can avoid lying ourselves. The Bible has abundant teachings on wisdom, finances, friends, relationships, uh, what we should do with our own thoughts, our own eyes, our own mouths, our own hands. And, and if we look at God's wisdom and, and how to appropriate it in our lives, what God's word, how to appropriate it in our lives, it will save us so many heartaches and so much trouble. And, you know, I've been talking about these things, but when I, th I think about the two most monumental and biggest ways we can think something is good and then it isn't are in choosing a marriage partner and in planning for eternity. The two biggest things that we can think something is good and that it isn't is choosing a marriage partner and planning for eternity. In marriage, how many people do we know, or maybe it's, maybe it's been you, that you fell in love and thought their spouse and marriage would be wonderful and good, and then it wasn't. That's just a heartbreaking thing. Maybe the spouse turned out to have a violent temper or wandering eye or is dishonest or has money problems or, or an addiction was some kind of thing that the person didn't know about. You know, an extreme example of this would be Lacey Peterson. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but she married a man named Scott Peterson. I believe they lived in California. He was a kind, loving, well-mannered, established man with a good job. He was fun. Lacey's family loved him. He looked good uh, until he didn't. In 2002, he killed her and their unborn child and was having an affair with a woman named Amber Fry. Amber Fry didn't know he was married, but Amber Fry also thought he looked good until he didn't. So it's best to take your time before marriage and put in a lot of prayer and get lots of wise counsel and research that person and do a lot of this before you get so, so, so involved with them that, you, that it's really hard to break off with them. Please, I beg you to use your brain along with your head. In this day and age, I hate to say this, but this is the way I feel. You know, I would, I would suggest anybody get a credit report on someone before you get married because I can't tell you how many people get married to someone and then after they get married, they find out that what kind of horrible debt that the person is or all the difficult um, uh, financial problem the person is in and then they're married and then the person that married that person has all of those problems now too. So. It's very important to have God's wisdom and take your time and use your brain when getting married. And then the most, most, most important of all is salvation. How many millions of people throughout time have looked at their life and thought it looked good until they came before the Lord and it didn't? What is seen then if a person has not been born again, has not repented of their sins and put their trust in Jesus Christ, is what the Bible says in Romans 3, 23. 
It says, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. And if we come before the Lord after we pass away, we come before the Lord and we've not been washed in the blood of Jesus, what God sees is a person who's sinned and fallen short of the glory of God because he's given this free gift to, uh, to us. The Heavenly Father is not looking for perfect people, but for those who have put their trust in the perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, a person can really enjoy life, do a lot of good things, love and enjoy all the pleasures this world has to offer that can be found lacking before the Lord. The Heavenly Father will be looking to see if we have put our faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, if we are washed in His precious blood. If a person has not, no matter how good their life seems on this earth, it will no longer be good for them in eternity. In Romans 6, 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God gives us a free gift, but we do have to do something to get that free gift. We have to repent of our sins. We need to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and we need to lay down our lives and serve him and follow him. So if you're alive on this earth, you still have time. You still have time to make that decision to repent of your sins and put your faith and hope in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Make a choice to follow him. You have a choice to make it good in this life here where you're at right now and for eternity. You won't, have, you won't want to enter eternity. You don't want to enter eternity and say, my life was good, but now it isn't. Let me say that again. You don't want to enter eternity saying that my life was good, but now it isn't. I encourage you to take that step to make, make that change so you will not have any eternal regrets, that you won't make a mistake on the biggest decision of, decision of your life, on what your eternity is going to be like. I encourage you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.